I wonder what it must have been like to be the Queen of France. To sit in a palace and eat all those delicious foods that your cooks can make while the peasants outside struggle to eat and sing about bread for some reason. I don't know, Les Mis reverence. It's a life of beauty, balls, and not listening to what the stinky peasants outside have to say. Except that's the very reason why Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France. You can only spend so much time and money on your exuberant lifestyle before the people get fed up. I mean, these people have nothing. It's kind of difficult to control people when they don't even have food at home. They let the queen know how upset they were when they decided to remove her head from her body. Most known for her liberal use of the wooden stake and the whole uh, burning folks alive thing. I, I wish I could tell you it was for barbecue, but it was actually for some more serious religious persecution and, and reformation. The Catholic Church was hot, but the witches and heretics burning at the stake or hotter, no cap. Number eight, Rena Valona of Madagascar. This one is a new one for me. Didn't know about this, but here we go. So basically, Queen Rena, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna call her Queen Ravioli because I can't pronounce it. Basically, Queen Ravioli takes over from her past husband. She says to herself, "How can I make things better?" Huh? I know. How about I become a ruthless, bloodthirsty, unaliving tyrant? Great idea, right? Yes, very uh, not great success. Yes, unfortunately she did many heinous things. Something I found out to be particularly interesting, however, was her destroying the many good things her husband had set up before her. Madagascar had some European intervention, and while it's true that a lot of times that is a bad thing, and yeah, it's a bad thing, and it does bring some bad stuff with it, however, it also brings a lot of good things with it. In Madagascar's case, it was markets, modern schools, trade, and diplomacy with, with Europe, and that's, that's good, money's good, you like that. Well, the queen wasn't having any of that, so she reformed. And by that I mean she repressed and, and re-unalived people. Number seven, Empress Irene. Kings, queens, emperors, and empresses. Chances are these folks are related. It's a family thing, a mia familia, you know what I mean? It's how it goes when you're the king and you need a son to continue the lineage. Even though I would like to argue that if you're gone, you're gone. So who really cares who's taken over? Just my opinion. Speaking of eye gouging, Oh, wait, I didn't mention that before. I made a segue, but okay, that's all right, bad segue. Well, the, the topic of discussion here is Empress Irene. Basically, her son was taking too much power for himself. She was losing hers and yada yada, and his eyes were gouged out from two guards ordered by his dear, sweet mother. Can you blame her though? I mean, come on, he was threatening a rule. She worked so hard to get there. The chief was just silent on this one. Chief had no words for that one, guys, no words. Number six, Fu Hao. Another woman in history married to a man in the stinky patriarchy. Worst, except Fu Hao didn't want to be wife 57 of 64. She wanted more than that. And to be honest, I think that's fair. You go girl, who wants to be wife 57 of 64? Maybe some people in Utah, I don't know. What's maybe slightly more unholy than having that many wives is going on an epic military campaign and raging war in the Shang Dynasty. A warrior queen, if you will. We know some of this history based on her tomb as she was buried with ceremonial weapons, knives, blades, swords, some dogs, some uh, human sacrifices, gold, money, jade, and lots of other valuable goodies. Just makes you want to loot all the stuff in there, doesn't it? I mean, Jade's pretty cool. This was a common practice amongst male warriors back then, but you know what? Good for her and all that unaliving. Way to go, sister. I like it. Very nice. Okay. Number five. Rebel Princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The Queen's younger sister was known as the Rebel Princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. 
At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as Queen Regent, but soon a growing conflict started, causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Architatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others, not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of old Blighty, I think of royal prestige. London and Buckingham Palace. After all, that's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. And she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. 
Move over, your royal highness. I'm moving in. Just got to get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey, step bro. Now, as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So, I'll just close the door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're going to do. <sighs> Number 8. Breaking Tradition For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love. Or so wish to swoon. Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Habernathy am asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was going to have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm going to say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number 7. Did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power, and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, all attempts and her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number 6. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might have heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five. The Bedchamber Crisis. May 1839, the Bedchamber Crisis happened when Whig politician Lord Melbourne resigned as Prime Minister. This is a big deal because it was only a couple years right after Victoria became Queen. So again, timing here was just not ideal. The first Prime Minister, Whig politician, Lord Melbourne, was close with Victoria originally. He actually convinced Victoria to appoint a good amount of her ladies in waiting. So he had power over her, but it was a mutual agreement. It wasn't like, you know, the other power that she had her whole life. This is they were homies. They were homies, I said, in a video about Victoria. So in 1839, when Melbourne resigned, Tory Robert Peel came in to be Prime Minister, and he requested that Victoria dismiss these ladies in waiting and then replace them with Tory ladies. Well, since Victoria was an OG and these were her only real friends if there was such a thing growing up, she said no. So of course she was criticized for such a choice. Prince Albert luckily was able to have some of her ladies resign voluntarily so things smoothed over eventually, but the Queen honestly never got a break. Even on the happiest days, like number four, her engagement. The life of Queen Victoria wasn't anything like a fairy tale, obviously, as I've said anything so far. So when you think about the royal family, at least when I was younger, I thought being a queen or king was just eating chocolate all day and then you attend galas. Yeah, you just eat yummy foods, wear a crown, look cute, and then go to the ball. 
No, not quite. I, that's not really how it's like at all. Victoria had to do everything herself. She even had to propose to Prince Albert. It's royal tradition that nobody shall propose to a reigning monarch, so in October 1839, Victoria had to ask Albert for his hand in marriage. It all started when the pair were 17 years old. Victoria met the young prince, of course, at Kensington Palace. They were put together because Victoria's uncle felt like this could be beneficial down the road. They were first cousins, now they're getting married, which sounds bizarre, but as you've seen on this channel before, with royalty and stuff, it's quite common. Number three, first marriage. The wedding of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert happened in St. James Palace Chapel on February 10th, 1840. This was a big deal because it was the first time a ruling queen was getting married. This hadn't happened in 286 years. The last marriage of a reigning queen was in 1554, and that was Queen Mary I. Queen Victoria had 12 bridesmaids, wore white, had a lovely dress, thing was like 18 feet long, it was gorgeous. But it must have been so overwhelming for the young queen because she was isolated for her entire life, and then all of a sudden, what? You're getting married outside at 20 in front of all these crowds? After the wedding, Queen Victoria's head was hurting. It was probably so stressful, but she still had the time of her life. She wrote this in her diary after her wedding. She wrote, I never, never spent such an evening. My dearest, dearest, dear Albert. His excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. His beauty, his sweetness, and gentleness, really, how can I ever be thankful enough to have such a husband? To be called by names of tenderness I've never yet heard used to me before was bliss beyond belief. Oh, this was the happiest day of my life. Yeah, when you're locked up and you have a horrible duchess watching your every move, this day probably sounds like a nice break. A well-deserved break, I'd say. Eat all the cake you can have. Number two, attacks. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. An 18-year-old man named Edward Oxford fired towards the queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. And then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt after attempt. But at one point, things were creepy and almost worse. Number one, Boyd Jones. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here at all, I saved it for last because it's very creepy. It's mind-blowing in a horrible way. A teenager stalked the Queen back in 1838 until 1841. His name was Edward Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. Just some Assassin's Creed going on here. Guy just knows our route, I guess. That's so scary. He would break in and he would hide under the Queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne and, one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers figuratively and literally. Like he would go and he would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully the guy got caught. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. See, what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal Curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crowns still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues. Okay. Another professor, years later, who worked in the crypt as well, became paralyzed at age 62. 
A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace. Just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know. Just, I don't know, use your imagination, I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head. That's sad, it's tragic. And another professor died in 1936, shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbags. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Bolin. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Bolin. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial, so Somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest. Horrible. That's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy. Listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. So Mary was close, but now what? While Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if you're family, it's, shit gets crazy.